stand on God's word or God's truth and know his voice. I'm like, man, again, Lord, this is going to be a hard one, but I uh, couldn't get that, those words out of my head for the last two weeks. The philosopher Plato, Plato, is that right? Yeah, not Plato, Plato. He says that our purpose in life is to obtain the highest end of information. I think I failed there. Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin claims it is to be the most fit for survival. Various regions around the world, various, or would say that the purpose of life is to be a good person. I'm not quite sure what a good person actually even is. But, you know, as we know, they're all wrong. As fun as they are, they are all wrong. In the, uh, this is another hard word for you, what is written in the Westminster Catechism? Is that right? Yeah. It is? She. There goes two days of learning that word. So in the Westminster Catechism, it says this, the chief purpose for which man is made is to glory, sorry, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now I'd call that a great purpose in life. Wouldn't you? I'd call that you we want to base our life on that line. I am like you, so thankful to be a Christian. It's phenomenal. That we know the truth. And we learn from Christ's teaching. I recall when I, when I um, met Christ, when I got saved, I was in a business with my wife, Shirley, and we were working together and we came across a man called Winston, Winston Broad who was, he became my, my mentor, my business mentor, and over the years a very, very good friend and still a good friend today. And um, he was one of those Christians. But I didn't mind that. That was okay. He's a nice guy. He's the sort of guy that the more you spent time with him, the more you liked him. You know, um, I think he used to always ask me, Rob, where do you sit with, this, with God? One day you've got to look into it and work it out. But he didn't preach it to me. I learned about God through him from what he did actions-wise, not what he said. He just seemed to have it all together. His wife and him would hold hands in public, married 25, 30 years, and they were happy. In my life, I hadn't come across husbands and wives that spoke highly of each other or were still married or their kids would talk to them still. So this guy had it, he seemed to have it all together. Like, man, what has he got? I wouldn't mind what he's got. And he had a, he had a friend, so I spent five years watching this bloke. I spent five years checking him out, seeing what he was like behind the curtain. Is he, is he the real deal? What, in front of the curtain and with his wife and kids in private. And he was like, man, you, you, you aren't like anybody else I've come across him in my, at that time, my family and my, my culture of friends. And he had a mate of his flying to Perth and he was a bloke called John Abram, who I met earlier in, in the piece a few times and John Abram was a very famous or well, very well known, not quite famous, a very well known pastor in Adelaide looking for a bed so I offer John a bed at my place he comes over and we just have the longest God talk you could ever imagine it went that long, my wife went to bed she'd had enough right? and at quarter past one in the morning on a Tuesday morning John leads me in a prayer asking Christ into my life. I remember having my eyes closed like this, praying, and then I opened one eye, thinking I might see a few, you know, a bit of fireworks or, you know, in the, in the lake, this is really important. But there was nothing. All I heard was John say, good, now I can go to bed. <laughs> right? Um, but but a, as we... Um, in fact, John told me, Rob, because he was flying out back home again the following day, Rob, go find... A Bible, go buy a Bible, go find a good church, right? And to begin with, go read the book of John. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. So I go buy a Bible. One of Winston's friends 
was going to a church in Mudaloo. So I'll go there because he's going to go there. Somebody I, would, somebody I would know. And then that night, I ran, I read the entire book of John. I'm like, I'll get through this Christian thing in no time. Walk in the park, right? I go to this church in Mudaloo. Mark Wilson's speaking down there, and he spends half an hour talking about one verse. <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> how did you get all of that out of that few words? Then I realised that, you know, okay, maybe I'm a bit ahead of myself, right? But um, as Christians, we learn through life, while we live in a world, we don't follow the world. As Christians, we, we learn that, um, um, that we don't follow what the world believes. You know, um, our, our thinking changes, our beliefs changes. Everything changes. But we do live in a world today that is pushing so many agendas. It's phenomenal. Trying to change what we think and how we think, it appears like it's getting worse. I mean, only the other day we saw the football club CEO get asked to resign, forced to resign, because he's a Christian. And his beliefs don't quite meet the beliefs of a footy club. You you can't go to a Disney movie today without seeing seeing Disney pushing an agenda. It's like everything we do and see and hear, there's behind there's an agenda being moved. I think it's important today, and this is what God asked me to cover, that we all know what we believe. We need to stand on what we believe, even when it isn't popular, or even when it isn't easy. If you've seen the movie called, or the series called Chosen, I love, it's a great, season three is taking years to come out, but it's a great, is it two weeks? It's a great series. In the beginning credits, it has these fish going round in a lovely song, these fish going round and round and round, all these fish going in circles round and round and round. And then all of a sudden you see a couple of the fish turn around and go the opposite direction. They're Christians. Our role isn't to go around and around with everybody else. Our role is to think how Christ thinks, not how the world thinks. And we are to go the opposite direction. Sometimes upstream, sometimes against the tide. But as my old friends always say, Rob, dead fish can float downstream. The live ones always go upstream. Well, like you, like me, we are the live ones. But, this, but all through history, there's been people pushing agendas. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, There is nothing new under the sun. Pastor Steve's favourite uh, favorite line. That means this is not new. It's always been happening. You go through, um, the Bible tells us in the early Colossian church, there were people there pushing their own agenda, trying to change the way the Colossian church um, thought and take them away from the gospel. If you want to bring up um, a great verse for us, um, Paul, Colossians 2, 6, 10, and this we can read together. Uh, 2, 6, 10, all the way to 12, uh, sorry, to, to, to 10, Paul. So it says here, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. And your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone, this is the important bit, don't let anyone capture you with, any, with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of the world rather than from Christ. For Christ For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and every authority. 
See, here Paul warns the Colossian church to recognize the truth and not allow themselves to get persuaded or influenced by the world. Paul's warning is still true today. Love the way Paul reminds the Colossians that we are only complete through union with Christ. What a great way. And that Christ is the head over every ruler and every authority. Big amen there. Goodness. So we aren't to have our thinking based on what others think or the government or social media or mainstream media or some silly football club. We are not to be easily influenced by the passing parade of beliefs that come from the world. And there are so many. They're all trying to change the way we think, what we believe. In fact, the world's agenda is quite simple. You can do it in one line. The world's agenda is to take us away from God. All through history, people of faith have had to learn to be strong and hold on to God's word, sometimes with their fingertips. We need to be strong and know God's word. We should not allow ourselves as Christians to be tricked or deceived. There are some great um, um, verses in the Bible that do show us how some people were really easily influenced, persuaded, or, or, de- or deceived. Exodus 32.1 is a great one. Um, in this case here, this is a story of Moses had gone up the mountain. Now, he was getting the Ten Commandments. It took a while, right? Um, and he hadn't returned for, for, for quite a long time. So in, in verse 1, it says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain... They gathered around Aaron, that's called peer pressure, (laughs) and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Now this case here, it's like, oh, terrible thinking. The problem we have is that the people, the crowd, persuaded the leader Aaron. And what did Aaron do? Aaron did as they wanted. So sadly, Aaron was really easily influenced. In Matthew 27, 20, it's the opposite way around. This is a great verse too. This is where um, Pilate is sitting on the judgment seat with Barabbas and Jesus. Um, And he asks the crowd, he says, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus? And the verse says to us here, it says, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. So here we have the leaders and the elders influencing, persuading Deceiving a crowd of people. And the crowd of people called out, Free Barabbas, execute Jesus. Again, the, the leaders influenced the crowd. And the leaders were wrong. There's a great picture here, which I found a little while ago. I'll show it to you as well. This is a picture of Nazi Germany in 1936. It's such a powerful picture. The guy in the circle refused to do the Nazi salute as Hitler drove past. The large proportion of Germany... Phenomenal numbers of Germany were sold out and deceived by the Nazis in Germany. The powerful German church, for example. And there is one man who says, no, 
I'm not going to give in. Now there's peer pressure. It's a great story. We as Christians, we hope as the world turns and moves that we are that man. I only praise Christ. I only worship Christ. I only follow Christ. Not some mere man. So we need to know what we believe and stand on that. We also need to know um, Christ's voice. We've got to learn to hear Christ's voice. I love it in uh, John 10, 27, where Christ says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Because, you know, in the, in the days of Christ, back in, uh, in Israel, um, shepherds would lead their sheep. They'd go for a walk, and they'd call their sheep, and all their sheep would follow them. In the West... We drive sheep. We make noises. We get dogs and we get sticks and hammers and whistle and so on. And we drive. We, we scare the heck out of them to make them move in the West. True? In fact, in, the, in, in Israel back in the day, the, they used to bring their flocks together. You'd have three or four shepherds come together at night time and they'd share a fire, have a chat, have a catch up. right? And all their flocks would come together into one big flock. And in the morning... Each shepherd would go their own way to go find a pasture. And as they walked out of this huge flock, they'd call their sheep. And all the sheep in that huge flock knew which shepherd they belonged to. And they'd follow that that shepherd and find their way to their new pasture under the care and love of their shepherd. I remember hearing a story about this. Um, it's amazing how some things come back to you in your head, but there was a Western farmer who wanted to go and see this. He wanted to go and see an Israeli shepherd leading sheep. So he flies to Israel, this is some time ago, he flies to Israel and gets here and gets told by a local person where to go and what, which town has you know, quite a few shepherds and sheep come through. You'll see one there, go to that town. He goes to the town, he's waiting for a while, he meets a, a young guy living in you know, his local bloke to the area. And the guy goes, you just wait here. There's always sheep coming through here. You will see what you want to see. Just hang around and wait. So he's this western farmer. He's hanging around. He's waiting. And you can see some sheep up on the mountain coming down. Oh, this is my time. I want to finally see the shepherds leading the sheep. And as they came closer and it got more clearer, he saw a guy behind the sheep with a stick in his hand. And he's banging the sheep, kicking the sheep, making them move forward. And this poor Western farmer, he's like, oh man, it's all a myth. I can't believe it. I've come all this way to see a leading sheep. And all I'm seeing is what we do in the Western countries. This is terrible. And a local guy saw him being upset. And he goes, you know, you, uh, why are you angry? And the, and the farmer told him, and the bloke, goes, the bloke goes, oh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. That guy, he isn't a shepherd. He's the butcher. <laughs> well, that was quite funny. <laughs> but but, but, um, but uh, the sheep know the shepherd's voice. So I am thankful. I am. I am so thankful that I am... A Christian. I'm thankful that John Abram had enough guts to talk to me about Christ. And with some broad, he worked on me in love for five years. Because I wouldn't know where I'd be. My history was pubs, footy, and fights. I was good at all of them. So I, I do wonder where I would be if not for Christ. It's good to know. Life's purpose. So many folks haven't got one. Their goal is to get debt free. Their goal is to, don't know, pay off a debt, get a new job. Um, And we get old doing that. We get old doing all that. But a true purpose must include Christ. But we still need, and I need, to constantly remind myself to keep my life anchored to God's truth. 
to keep my thinking anchored to God's truth. And whatever I do when I make my decisions, they must be anchored on God's truth. In, in a world where we're facing so many agendas, trying to change what we think and how we think, we need to ask ourselves this question, which I ask myself quite a bit. Am I allowing myself to be influenced by the world or am I making sure as a Christian that I am being influenced by God's word? Robert Grant, who um, uh, leads a group um, uh, of, or a company, Christian group in America, he once said, he said, if Christians unite, we can do anything. We can change governments. We can change or make any law in the land. So if you take, I used to do um, kids' church when I was an earlier Christian. I was a, when my kids were young, I used to run kids' church and help out down there. And that was great because you always got food and some bickies and a bit of fruit, a bit of juice, right? But I always had, you know, they were five and six-year-olds. I always was to make sure they took away one point where kids' church, they can go away and, and have one point. So mum asked them, what you learn? They'd say, I learned this one point. So not that we're kids, um, but there are two points I want you to take, it, to take it away with this morning. Now the first one is, we are to live our lives on God's word. We are to live our lives on God's truth. We've got to see everything through God. There's a world vision and a Christian vision. There's a, excuse me, there's a world view and a Christian view. The second point is, with all the voices in the world, and there's so many voices in the world, it's hard to find quiet sometimes. In all the voices in the world, we are to listen to God's voice. Learn to hear God's voice and follow his voice only. I was once told there's three voices in our head the enemy's voice, our own voice, and God's voice. We've got to learn to be those sheep. We know which shepherd we belong to. Now, you could probably run a whole sermon on that, I think. I'll let Steve do it. <laughs> Sounds too hard for me. Um, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks, Father. We give you thanks, we give you all the honour and all the glory. For again, Father, it is you who we follow. You are our shepherd. Please help us learn to hear your voice, Lord. Help us honour you in everything we do. Help us honour you over peer pressure. Help us honour you over politics. Help us, Lord, to honour you over opinion, over culture over world views. Help us again, Lord, to hear your voice and to follow your voice only. And help us, Father, to share your love and what you have done for us to others. Help us be bold in telling others that the real purpose of life is to glorify you and enjoy you forever. We give you thanks, Father, and I give you thanks for this church and this time for uh, sharing. I give you thanks for, Lord, I understand how we praise you on our knees and we praise you with tears in our eyes and we praise you with our arms raised. raised. All we can do is praise you, Lord, and give you thanks and honour you in all we do. Amen. You know, the, um, the easiest thing you'll ever do in your entire life is give your heart to Christ. The most important thing you'll ever do in your entire life is to give your heart to Christ. There is no second. If you're unsure on where you stand with Christ, this would be a great time today, this morning, before 
tea and coffee. That you give your heart to Christ. Ask him for his voice. Ask him for his truth. Have a hunger to learn who he is. Have a hunger to, to chase him down. He loves Christians that want to chase him. He is thrilled by that. So if you aren't sure where you stand with Christ, you know, we're done here, but if you want to hang around, I can wait a minute or two on the front here, feel free to come down and you say a simple prayer asking God into your heart. It will completely, it, things don't change overnight. In my case, it wasn't the case at all. It's a process that God takes us on. It's a journey. It's transformation, but it isn't just once. It's a transformation every day. We walk in Christ. I have learned so much and transformed from when I was a year ago. Two years ago. Heck, now, last week. So it's continual transformation in, in Christ. So I thank you for this morning. I do hope, because um, God gave me a tough one and I was kicking and screaming all the way this morning here, but I do hope that you understand that, you know, as Christians, we are the light on the hill. People out there are as lost as lost can be. You couldn't, the word lost doesn't even cover it. They're so lost, they don't know if they're a girl or a boy. Girl Tuesday and a boy Thursday. They are lost. And we hold the truth and we hold the answer and the purpose and the love and the freedom that Christ gives. So may God give you what I'd call a um, divine appointment this week. And may he give you a nudge on your shoulder and say, tell that person about me because someone told you about him. And it's our role to go and tell others. And we stand strong on God's word and we hear his voice. And one day we'll be in a new world and happy as a, happy as a pig in mud. Anyway, God bless you.